Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. So the first couple of slides really are, I want to see who's in the audience. So all right, a little bit of everything. Um, and then for the trainees, are you definitely interested in academia, leaning towards academia, undecided, leaning towards private practice, or definitely interested in private practice? OK, so again, all over the board. All right, well, I'm going to tell you why I went into um, academics and why I joined the academic practice that I'm at. Um, and the main reason, really, is my mentors. And these are the mentors that I've had through my radiology career. Um, now, the definition of a mentor is an experienced person who assists you in developing specific skills and knowledge that will enhance your professional and personal growth. Um, in lay term, really, it's someone that helps you do a good job and tells you you're doing a great job with a double thumbs up when you, when you do a good job, and also is there for you um, and support you when things are not going well. So again, back to the audience. Um, do you feel like you have plenty of mentors, have some but not enough, or don't really even have a mentor? Okay. All right. Um, so what did my mentors do for me? Well, really, my mentors were my role models. They were always supportive and available for me. Um, they not only taught me radiology, but as Rich said, um, my chairman at the time when I first got my job um, knew that I was interested in research and, and reached out and said, oh, you know, Harvard is down the street and they have this summer program and you should do the clinical effectiveness program and get your master's in public health. And he not only gave me the time, but helped fund for that. Um, my other mentors encouraged me to take leadership roles, even when I was reluctant to, because I was nervous about, about the time commitment. My mentors helped me achieve work-life balance. That's something I think we all struggle for, um, many women, particularly with children. Um, and I was also fortunate enough to be able to work part-time for portions of my career. So my mentors really have allowed me to have the best job ever. I love my job. Um, and not only am I able to take care of patients and, um, and their breast issues um, and work with residents such as yourself, I've traveled um, halfway around the country. This is uh, me talking at the Arab Health Conference about breast imaging. And also I've had the opportunity to spend time with my husband and my three kids. This is us in Alaska this past summer at Denali National Park. So this was an interesting paper in 2010 that looked at role models in academic medicine. And they took 35 residents who were in an academic development program, and then another 103 who weren't in the program. And only about half said that they had enough role models. So over half really felt like they didn't have any role models similar to, to the survey here. Um, and 68%, so two thirds, over two thirds, said that they were more likely to stay in academics if there were more role models. And then when asked about characteristics that they wanted in a role model, interestingly enough, some of the higher, character, higher rank characteristics had nothing to do with the clinical skills or the person's um, ability to be a radiologist, but really was all about personality and availability. So number two reason why I wanted to join an academic practice was that I wanted to be really a subspecialist radiologist. I wanted to be an expert in one field. So again, a poll for the audience. Do you prefer limiting your focus so that you can be an expert in one thing, or do you like multiple aspects of radiology and, and want to know about them and, and do them equally? OK, so a split. Um, so I, I felt like I wasn't smart enough to know all of radiology. And I really believed that to understand one thing well was better than understanding many things um, by halves. And it is, generally speaking, easier to be a subspecialist in academics than it is in private practice. Nowadays, private practice do have a lot of subspecialists, but they are also expected to do general radiology. So my path, is, as um, Dr. Sharp had pointed out, I did my residency and then did a fellowship in women's imaging and practiced a little bit of both breast imaging and OBGYN ultrasound, which was part of my fellowship training for many years until 2012 um, when I became chief of breast imaging. And then really my administrative roles um, prohibited me from, from doing as much clinical work that I was doing before. And so I wound up giving up the OBGYN stuff. So the third reason why I enjoy academics was the opportunity to do research and innovation. Do you feel as, as a trainee that you have many opportunities and you're very interested? You have limited opportunities, but you would like more? You're not really interested even though the opportunities exist or you're interested with, not interested with limited opportunities? OK, a little bit all over the board again. Um, so 
I did my what I call obligatory research, right? So in undergrad, uh, I was a bio major, and I had to, to get to graduate with honors, I had to um, submit a thesis, and I did my thesis on um, rat tapeworms. I grew tapeworms in rat intestines, and for those of you who know me, um, probably are chuckling, because that's so not me, and it had nothing to do with the interest in tapeworms or rats, but it really was all about the mentor. Um, and this was my mentor, and this was, this was what she studied, and I wanted to be like her. Um, in medical school, I had two other mentors, Martha Hutchinson and Elizabeth Oates, that helped me kind of start with my first publications. But it wasn't until residency that um, I really started doing research that I found interesting. And so my advice to those of you who are in training, think of a project that interests you, be involved from start to finish, start with the IRB, do the abstract, do the presentation so you get to travel to a fun meeting such as this, um, and see it through, through publication. Now, if you're not sure what to do, look to your mentor for inspiration and advice on feasibility. And Debbie Levine, who many of you probably know, she's deputy editor of radiology, was one of my mentors. And it was always great to do projects with her because they always got published. <laughs> um, so these are some of the things I consider fun research and things that I work on now. The other aspect of research that I'm fortunate enough to be involved with in academics. If you're in an academic practice, you tend to have a, more of an exposure to new technology. So computer-aided detection was something that actually came out when I was a resident um, in the days of film mammography. Um, and then the DMIS trial came out, so I had exposure to digital mammography during my training well before digital mammography was, was available um, nationally. Um, the screening whole breast ultrasound trial, again, I got to come to Chicago, learn about how to do screening whole breast ultrasound, um, and I was involved in that. Fetal MR, one of my mentors was a pioneer of fetal MR, so again, I was able to do that. And then some things that we're working on now, um, while I'm chief, is, you know, we're converting to 3D mammography, and there's a TMIS trial coming out, so we've been selected as a site for that. And the other thing is contrast-enhanced spectral mammography. So new technology, and we're going to be the only site in New England that's doing it. Now, research is not easy, and being innovative is not easy, so you definitely need support from your department and from your institution. And just a little plug, whether you're in academics or private practice or whatever field you ultimately wind up going to, I think it's really important for us as a specialty to support research and innovation, um, because we are competing with other specialists for, for the technology and for the business. This was an interesting study for a number of years ago, and they surveyed 119 radiologists that just graduated from large academic programs. Um, and about 50 went into, 50 percent went to academia and 50 percent didn't. But really, the most interesting thing to me was that those who published in residency were 26.4 times more likely to stay in academics and go to academia for their first job. So another reason why I like academics is the teaching and education aspect of it. So survey for the audience. I love to teach, give talks, as it's helped me learn. I teach because I'm expected to. I teach to enhance my CV. Or I teach one-on-one, -on -one but avoid public speaking at any cost. OK, good. Um, so the reality is all physicians are teachers, right? Teaching is part of the Hippocratic Oath. And the word doctor actually originates from a Latin verb, which means to teach. Um, but it is more essential to kind of take a more serious role as an educator and teacher um, if you decide to go into academics. I love the saying, to teach is to learn twice, because I truly believe it. To teach something, you really have to know it. And you often are, are learning it again and again before you teach it. So I've been fortunate enough to be involved in many aspects of education, not just for the students um, and the trainees, but also for the referring clinicians, for the patients. Um, there is a patient that actually invited me. She has a hair salon in an underserved area of Cambridge. And so when I was reading her mammogram and talking to her, she said, you know, you should come and talk to my neighborhood people about it because they're not getting screened. And so in two weeks, I'm going there in you know, blue jeans, and we're going to get our hair done, and I'm going to talk about breast imaging. But great way to kind of pay it forward to the patient population. Um, and then also the opportunity um, to teach the larger medical community, such as conferences like this and through publication. And the most fascinating part of, of teaching and being an educator is that I feel like I'm continuously learning and evolving and, and, and really um, taking in all the feedback because the way we teach 
now is going to be different from the way we teach in the future and the way we taught in the past. So in honor of the recent holiday Thanksgiving, Lola May, she was a mathematician, um, had this saying, there are three things to remember when teaching. Know your stuff, know whom you are stuffing, and then stuff them elegantly. And um, so obviously I knew my ABCs well before I made it to radiology residency, um, but I've had to relearn them really to, to teach our trainees because their ABC chart is very different from the one that I grew up with. Um, this is an infographic, so again, for Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October, I wanted to do something for our patient population um, about the myths, and you can't read these, and you're not really expected to, but it really is, you know, I'm, I'm too young to get breast cancer, no one in my family has breast cancer, so how can I have it? It was all these myths that we heard over and over again as we talked to the patients, and so I wrote them down and, and saw the web design person at the hospital, and she put together this wonderful infographic that's online, um, and if you click on one of these links, it goes to, to a fact sheet. Um, so just like research, education is an integral part of the academic mission. We need time to teach, we need adequate funding to teach, um, and some of the research shows that 15 to 20 percent of the cost of an academic department could be attributed to educational activities. So this is not an easy thing for an academic practice to do. And so again, you have to have support from your chair, who happens to be one of my mentors. So again, I'm very fortunate. So another reason why I joined an academic practice was for leadership opportunities. Now, um, you know, I have a bunch of titles, and, and Harvard loves giving titles. But really, it's not the titles that matter, but the titles do help me um, have the ability to be impactful at a larger scale. And again, here are a number of other mentors. So in addition to the screening mammogram and educating um, my personal patients and even our patients, I can be involved in setting guidelines for screening mammography. Um, a couple years ago, I started a multidisciplinary breast conference at our, our, our department because I really thought it was important to review our breast core biopsies outside of the ones that were reviewed at Tumor Board. And um, Jim Conley, who's one of the pathologists, world-renowned pathologists, said, you know, we should kind of bring this on the road. And so he and I um, speak at many pathology conferences, and, and we've had about a dozen people start multidisciplinary conferences across the country with our help and, and um, our support. Um, it allows me to be on various committees such, uh, throughout RSNA and other corporations, um, and also uh, involved in hospital policies. So this is Kevin Tabb, who's CEO of the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, um, and Stu Rosenberg, who's one of the um, leaders in the physicians group. And it's great to be at the table with these people so that I can give them, share my voice and my colleague's voice on how um, I see radiology in the future. Um, the most favorite part of my leadership um, path is really the opportunity to be a mentor to, to the junior faculty and to the students and the trainees, and I really, I, I hope that I can open doors for them um, similar to the way my mentors have opened doors for me, so it really is all about paying it forward. Now, leadership in academics, um, uh, get, it, there are more opportunities for collaboration and innovation. Um, you get to participate in hospital governance and committees and even um, form medical school curricula. Um, the next speaker is someone who's going to talk about private practices and, and uh, is, is a very strong member of the ACR, but generally speaking, um, more leaders of the national and international organizations do wind up coming from academic practices. Um, and depending on your ultimate career goals, there are more opportunities at higher level in terms of being a chair or a dean, um, if that's something that interests you, if you are from an academic practice. Now the last reason really was that salary didn't matter. It was a lot of money either way. So last question for the audience. Salary plays or played an important role in your decision to stay in academics versus private practice. Okay. Um, so, you know, salary didn't matter, and it's not because I came from money. I was actually born in Mumbai. My parents immigrated here with two suitcases. Um, you know, we moved around a lot, really, to keep a roof over our heads. I had eight schools between kindergarten and 12th grade, and I wound up going, picking my undergraduate based on what was free. 
and then I decided I was going to go to medical school where I wanted to, so picked one of the top five most expensive medical schools in the country and went to Tufts. Um, and when I finished and finished residency, these were the starting salaries in academics and private practice, and the reality was that was more money than I had ever seen in my life, so it, again, didn't really matter. Um, and just, uh, you know, you think for those of you who have a lot of debt, who don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and I just want you to know my school debts are paid off, my college tuition is saved for from my boys, I own my car, I live in Boston, which is an expensive place to live, um, but my primary house is almost paid off. We have a little vacation home in Vermont, and uh, I do have the opportunities to travel, and my other hobby, um, my family's hobby, is, to, is fine dining, so we are able to do that as well. So it is possible, regardless of what path you pick, don't let money be the deciding factor. Here's the median salaries in the U.S. that I looked up for 2014, and again, it's a lot of money either way. Um, private practice has a little bit more vacation, shorter time to partnership, but academia has better health and retirement benefits. So these are the reasons why I joined an academic practice, and outside of my mentors, these are the reasons, these are my breast imaging colleagues, where I am, and why I stay, and I've been there for 20 years, um, and I hope that I've given you a flavor of academia and you decide to follow in a similar path that I have. Thank you.